tonight guys <laughs> Aaron for next season I think we should go with that other song Everybody, um, it's so good to see all your faces. This moment at the beginning of a reading where everybody's just joining the Zoom is just it's a really beautiful moment. I love it so much. Um, so thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us for the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshops June 2021 encore installment of the Before Time Reading Series. This is the end of season one um, for this series. So that is very exciting. It's been so cool to just watch these readings and now to be involved in one is super great. Um, so I am Marlon M. Jenkins. I am a poet who is very excited to be newly involved with MPWW. Um, and I'll be your host. Um, before we go further, um, I want to acknowledge that I am zooming in here from uh, what is currently the Twin Cities in Minnesota, but we want to acknowledge that this is Dakota, Ojibwe, and Anishinaabe land. Um, and so we want to make sure that we uh, we acknowledge that before anything else. And also acknowledge that this is being recorded. So um, if you are uh, shy and you don't want your face in the recording, please feel free to turn off your camera. Um, otherwise, whatever works for you works for us. Um, this will be put on our YouTube channel. Um, so that is what is going on with that. Also, please stay muted um, during the program, just to make, th make things easier, make sure we don't have any weird background noise. There's a moment at the end where I'll ask you to unmute and say hello or cheer and whatever else, but until that moment at the end, we'll ask that you make sure your microphones are muted. And so this reading, the Before Time series, was inspired by our bi-monthly reading series with the Stillwater Prison Writers Collective. 
And since we can't have the in-person reading series right now, because um, it's on hold indefinitely, unfortunately, during the pandemic, we wanted to offer this monthly recorded event as a small offering to our students, who we unfortunately have not seen since early March of last year. This series before time brings together local and national writers, as well as our instructors, mentors, and alums. And we're so grateful to all of our guests who have made this such a vibrant virtual reading series. We also like to thank our sponsor, Voices in the Valley, which is funded by Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan. Um, fun fact, and Sue, I don't even know if you know this. Um, I went to Saginaw Valley State University. Um, Come on and, up. Uh, yeah, and was involved in, <laughs> in the Voices in the Valley uh, reading series. Shut uh, up, no way. Um, Arlen Ross, who runs it. Amazing. A, uh, professor and undergrad mentor and uh, advised my undergrad thesis. So I love when there are all those great connections that all, all come together in this small and vast poetry world. Um, and so we thank you, uh, yeah, again, for all the sponsorship and all the folks who helped make this happen. Um, in the fall, um, we'll be back on a quarterly basis, thanks to this sponsorship. And now we get into the exciting part where we get ready for our readings. So tonight we are honored to bring you six brilliant writers. We'll have Kennedy, we have Sarah Borjas, we have Dante Collins, we have Faisal Mahudin, we have Glitter Squirrel, and we have Tracy K. Smith. After the reading, we'll have a Woo! chat. With the <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. Cheers. Um, afterward, we'll have a quick chat with the poets, we'll ask a question and have them respond. And then we'll have some special messages from MPWW instructors, Aaron Sharkey and Deborah Appleman. And we'll have a closing remark from our founder, Jennifer Bowen. And yeah, and I, I feel like we should cheer with our mics off at the beginning real quick. Can we have a cheer for all of our readers in excitement before we jump on in? Woo! Yay! Yeah. Oh, we love it. Okay, so um, I wanna to acknowledge too, we have what looks like 39 people in the room today here tuning in and listening. So thank you all again for being here and making this great. To kick off the evening, we wanna give thanks to our friends at We Are Criminals and our collaboration with The Scene Project. We're thrilled to feature our MPWW student, Kennedy. So Kennedy is an accomplished visual artist, poet, and the author, the author of The Liturgy of Smell with Red Bird Chapbooks in 2016. His work can be found in Agni, Territory, a Journal of Place, among other journals. He's a co-editor of the anthology Hidden Cast, Exploring America's Vulnerable Classes, forthcoming with Coffee House Press. Kennedy has written several books under the pen name Ken Amen and is currently working on a full length poetry collection. And now we'll go to a video of Kennedy's work. Kennedy, Wasifu Wamarahemu, the epitaph of death. There will be no roar of drums summoning mourners to my funeral. The great horn of the rhino will not sing my name. The women who love me won't be there to bathe me in milk or plant the red flowers that will eat my blood. The elders won't plant the giant fruit tree that will guide my spirit. The sacred black bulls won't stomp my grave like they did for my father, his father, and the fathers before him. The great python won't sleep on my grave in homage. My name will not be carved into a spear. My heart will not lie in the belly of the warrior drum, which rumbles on its own in war times. If this is exile, I don't know what to call home. Oh, beautiful. I love that moment of the first poem. Um, please, as we go as well, please put all of your love uh, for the poets in the chat. That would be wonderful. Um, and yeah, and we'll keep that energy going. Um, one of the cool things about these Zoom readings is that we can have the chat as a way to kind of immediately uh, give our feedback and love. 
I'm gonna go ahead and read a few of the comments here for Kennedy. We have a big thank you from Sue. Um, we have a wish that there was a snapping fingers reaction. I also wish there was a snapping fingers reaction on Zoom. Beautiful Kennedy, thank you, Kennedy. We have a quote of the line, if this is exile, beautiful poem, so many moving images, beautiful, thank you, beautiful and a lot of pondering going on. So thank you again, Kennedy. Um, we're gonna go right to our next reader. So our next reader is Sarah Borges. Sarah is a Chicana, Pocha, and Fresno poet. Her debut collection of poetry, Heart Like a Window, Mouth Like a Cliff, was published by Noemi Press in 2019, received a 2020 American Book Award. Sarah was named one of Poets and Writers 2019 Debut Poets and is a 2017 Canto Mundo Fellow. She stayed rooted in Fresno. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. And thank everyone for listening, like physically and emotionally <laughs> listening. It means a lot, um, yeah, to like share and to be heard. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read three poems. This first one is like my penultimate sad girl poem. It's like listening to oldies on the radio and being sad about like not being hella in love. And I feel like um, I'm from the Central Valley and we have like the Art Lebeau dedications on Sunday. And it's always just like, you know, people hollering from incarcerated folks hollering, hollering family and hollering to their kids, hollering to their loved ones. And it's like what I grew up and it's what I do listen to. Um, so it's inspired by, by those messages. It's called, a heart can be broken only once like a window and, and it's after Eduardo Corral. I miss the kind of love they sing about in oldie songs, but I don't ask for it anymore. My palms are turned down against Gus taking themselves away. I listen to wild parrots while I run between sycamores in the park. I walk around uncomfortable in my jeans and wonder if the holes are something I've made. I think about some things, so I don't think about other things. Pizza, poetry, neosporn. I eat my fried eggs out of a bowl shaped like a man's hands. The thin gold rings on his fingers are still mine. I have myself to remind me of love and that's all. I tie tiny triangles of glass to string I wear around my neck and some say it's pretty. When my mother doesn't recognize the jewelry adorning me, hoping, she asks if it's new. And even though I am Mexican, feel deeply and joke dark God still owes me a drink for every time the woman I should be has died. I no longer mean it when I say please. Sometimes words belong between certain people and neither one is you. Sometimes people are just lines in a song. Today, I feel like telling jokes instead of pretending to write pretty music and I'm angry with the word should I think about words so I don't think about loss or all the feathers left on my porch. I wanna open the front door and see a clean bird waiting for me on the doormat like I'm Snow White, even if it has rusted forks for wings. I once heard that the world breaks everyone, that afterwards many are stronger at the broken places. I wish a whole woman would wake up inside of me. Um, this is sad girl poem number two. No, I'm just kidding. Basic, kind of though, <laughs> kind of though. <laughs> uh, you know, this is me imagining, uh, you know, love, you know, part two. <laughs> it's called Imagine Variation of Order. I've made my coffee to every man's liking and still they leave shreds of themselves in this house. I find the toilet paper backwards on the roll 
hot Cheetos crushed in an unmade bed. I tiptoe through. I count the half empty glasses of water on the counter. Little hair stuck on the bathroom floor. I flirt with men at Old Dubliner over a glass of foggy beer and they ignore what I say. I am the house. My breeze, my breath is breeze like doers, slapping the shutters around. The wasted cups, the sheets covered in crumbs, the hair apostrophing my days, clutter I cannot overlook. I flap like a field mouse caught underneath the trap. My parents, the blueprint Chicanismo proposed to me. I am their chore list the coffee spilt, the crumbs scattered all over the floor. I resent every word from a man's mouth until he confesses to loving me, until he feels guilty for it. I open the door to each room, hoping the floor is swept, the window is whole, expecting to find a man on his knees, adoring me as I put countless cups away. And I'll read one more. Um, if anybody's from the Valley of California or, you know, Central Valley or familiar, there's like a tradition apparently, you know, I didn't know this till way later, but like Fresno poets, right? People are like, oh, you're writing Fresno poetry. How do you, do you feel like you need to live up to something? And I was like, I don't know these fools. <laughs> I don't know these fools. Like, I'm glad I know them now, but I didn't know them before. And I was asking like, how do I live up to the inheritance? And I was like, and there's a question I always worry about. I'm like, how do you inherit if you walk into like a house you don't know is there? You know, how do you, how do you handle that? And that's something I'm still thinking about. And um, this poem's a little bit about that. Uh, and also about being a Chicana writing poems. <laughs> so um, this is an Ars Poetica, which is my principles on poetry. Ars Poetica. In my Fresno, there are no prerequisites, just a frontage road inside the fence flopped to the west. Craft means white aesthetics and the cannons are obsolete, extinct. Anyone charging admission is an endangered gatekeeper playing dress up with belts and polo shirts. Here, poets rest between crop rows, welting the earth still dust like corduroy. Craft is twisted grapevine and a swirling fly. On one side, almond trees, pistachios, fill worker housing spray painted with ads. The fervent recall of history from poets in the tradition, hovers in the moment the door opens, calling down some half-lit hallway, clinging to the master's house like an old dog. There is an ocean eventually. I did not read the ice worker sings before I was a poet. I'm saying it now. I did not even believe some poems. I will not praise the poems about how sex with a prostitute can clear some cochino path to male enlightenment, or that confessing I can hear the brown and black whores calling my name vindicates a Chicano's colonized mind. Although I tried to love once and ended up punching everybody is one of my favorite lines from Fresno. You see, on the other side of my Fresno is orange groves and aqueducts and hills evolving into a majestic mattering the view from the mountain is trucks, dogs, oldies, dusk. I do not believe Andres Montoya wanted his book to operate as a fence or a container. I cannot recite the lines of Alarista at a party or the Dean's annual diversity dinner, but I was a poet before the books. Fresno is not a machine. It does not produce tenderness from the oppressed, from the farm worker, the housewife, the newly educated Chicano, like cotton gins or dive bars or Morrissey lyrics. Here, there are as many songs as silences, 
piled deep into soil until it becomes rock. Latinos beautiful as a basket of eyelashes, our eyes full as a packed back of a pickup. I can be kind through my anger and my intense hope. Cracked windshields, I can be honest as strawberry paletas or water feeding the lawn all day long. I can show you my wounds. Each candle my mother lights before she drinks alone. My father is machismo and my struggle to say I'm guilty of both, my stubborn and revolving logic. Each time I admit I want or deserve a name of my choice, my breath has to throw down with this ancestral stutter. These poetics are the sanchas of Duende that no one acknowledges and the ants that gossip over the landline. The alfalfa field remains mysterious. The junk in the yards is as blinding as light breaking into the crest of the Nevadas. But I'm not a genealogist. I do not enjoy certainty. I do not love loyalty. If you ask me, Larry Levis owes my grandma's denial for teaching him to meander. I'm not the scholar of the crop row, the unsung corrido of Pinedale, the historian of hoods, a philosopher of feral cats and packing houses. I'm not an inheritor. I'm a chatty tradition pushing from the inside of its tin. I'm the scrape of the low rider as it exits the driveway, bothering the neighbors. I am the ambitious orange head of the kinglet, raising questions from ash trees. Thank you, everyone. Woof. Oh, so good. I love this. This is so great. I love poems, y'all. Poems are pretty dope. Sue put a link in the chat um, at, up at the beginning of Sarah's uh, reading with a link to Sarah's book. Um, so please go and check that out from Noemi Press. And we're gonna jump into, and there we go. And there it is again. So it's nice and easy to find. Um, so our next poet, um, in my opinion, has one of the best hat games in all of poetry. Uh, Dante Collins is held black adopted queer, a surrealist blues poet haunted by the 1960s black arts movement. Named the inaugural youth poet laureate of St. Paul, Minnesota. They're the recipient of a McKnight artist fellowship for spoken word and the winner of the Most Promising Young Poet Award from the Academy of American Poets. They are a 2021 Gregory Janikian Scholar selected by the Adroit Journal and the author of the poetry collection Autopsy with Button Poetry in 2017, a finalist for a Minnesota Book Award. Collins is the recipient of the Mitchell Prize in Poetry from Osberg University, and is currently the program director of Black Table Arts, a community-driven arts cooperative launched in Minneapolis, Minnesota, gathering Black communities through the arts toward better Black futures. Dante Collins. Hey, what's up? Thank you, yeah, for being here. And thank you, Sue, for welcoming my voice into the space. Um, yeah, I've been a fan of MPWW for a while. And I realized at the last reading, B, I have to shout out B, his poem, um, prison pastoral. I read that years ago at um, maybe when I was 16, 17 um, at the state fairgrounds, there was a book fair there. And I remember that only because it was the first time that I purchased a book of poetry with my own money. It was um, Patricia Smith's should have been Jimmy Savannah. But I read that book in an, or I read that poem in an anthology. And it was during a time that my brother was serving 10 years, my uncle was serving 20 years for um, a crime he did not commit. Um, and that poem was a bomb. So at the last reading when B read that poem, I lost it. Um, so yeah, shout out to B forever for that piece. He says everything in prison moves and haunts caution. It's a haunting, beautiful poem. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm going to uh, follow Sarah's lead and start with a love poem. Um, I'll read four poems. Prayer severing the cycle for Tamika. 
My love is as ancient as my blood. And of course, my blood is still mine because a woman sweetened black with good song pulled me from the river like an ax pulled back from the bark. I learned love first as scar. And of course, my love is only mine because I found the nerve to say it is. My love is mine, but was first my mother's, not the how, but the why, but was first her mother's, not the how, but the why, not the how, not the how, how do you love? Not the how, how are you loving? Not the how, I am bored with this beat. I seek a different dance toward death. Lord, listen up, lean in. I crave a love that happens as sweetly as it was named. If love must be swung, let it soften, let it soften, let it soften not split. Prologue, number nine. What does your body remember? If the beginning must begin, the body must be considered. My birth mother's blood is smoke stirring in the forest of my forgetting. My birth mother's body is a leash my memory bites, tugs toward barking betrayal, betrayal. But she's alive. We live in North Minneapolis. We met. I was born at St. James Hospital, 622 PM. But in my childhood dreams, the beginning was sunlight arresting the wind. What mother? It was simple. Instead of birth, I laid alive beside, without a body, beneath a canopy of pine growing gold toward the sky. If I was anyone's son, it was only of sound, water returning to water. The sap beetle's soft chew, think of that, to be mothered by the music of hunger, by the chuckle of dried pine, crisp copper needles laughing loudly against the land. Listen. If I was anyone's son, it was only of what nouns the forest ripened with wind. Fruit wood, cypress, boy mothered by the swinging white moss, mothered by red clay, glossed marooned mud animated by rain. How pretty, how perfect, how often is memory a mirror reflecting only what won't shatter it. Silly child, to read foster care but conjure forest, to read biological, then dream the earth your loosened green womb. If ever a mother, she was the night's scintillant moon, a pocked single parent sickled by distance. For each dark mile, I dreamt a new not mother, mother made of crooked song, mother made of buzzing city wires, of flashing metal birds cleaving thin gray clouds, of midnight's silver mist, each imagined mother, a bright, brief ghost. Ghosts all missing by morning. This next poem is called, They Need Some of Us to Die. Um, I wrote it pretty early in the pandemic. Um, yeah, I was sort of exhausted um, and worried and um, yeah, I got off the phone with my sister and wrote this piece. And you should know that it, yeah, it mentions the invisible hand, which um, is a fallacy describing the non-existent social benefits of an individual self-interested actions in a free market economy. And um, yeah, being one of capitalism's many cloaks, um, attempting to make those who live within its system and make them responsible for sort of the heinous agenda of big, of big business and and government, so. Um, it's written in my Uncle Paul's voice, it's for him. Hell nah over my dead, I paid mine. I checked black and subtraction knows what it did. Made black a box to check, 
Subtraction doesn't know how even a sigh seasons the rue. In the second breath, my mother was always trying to catch. American, emergency. Subtraction doesn't know Black's many bodies and bodies of water, though subtraction does, sunken, gifting the seas new strange stones. Subtraction reopened the barbershops and bowling alleys, insists church, sent us home with inhalers and half-assed sentences. In God we, we the people, the people versus degradation, degradation versus a new package deliverance, homicide, hallelujah. I'll be damned. I'll be back before I'll be buried. I've been black and ain't slept since. Subtraction needs my blood to water their weapons to subtract my blood. Do you see the necessity for dreaming or else the need to stay awake, to watch? Worried, the hand, invisible, make a peace sign, then a pistol. Speech. And the last poem I'll share is called Rehearsal. It's an ode to my siblings. Um, I was adopted into a family of tap dancers. And yeah, this poem is for them. Um, and it's the poem I'll close with, so thank you. The falap is done with the tip of the shoe. The ball tap, the toe, is sudden, soft. Swing the foot forward to brush, then flick. It's careful though, deliberate, quick. Should mimic the keen click of a pen. Would be a ball change if you shift the weight, though this sound requires surgery, an incision in the silence. The ear permitting the ankle sharp sweep or release. Control, breath, release, she says, my mother. Stopping the music to adjust Tamika's arms, Carl's shoulders. Taisha's laces are undone, but doesn't dare look down. My mother, a drill sergeant of sound, hears hesitation, an unsure shuffle, a skipped beat. Again, she shouts, don't cheat. Tap is as much about intention as it is integrity. It's as much about the ground as it is about gravity. To be both bird and boulder, to sink then soar in seconds. The body, a decibel bracketing the quiet. The body birthing vibration. Aluminum against oak wood. Earth grinding earth. And my mother conducting a meticulous stampede. She patterns popping oil, says cadence is clinical. Each step sterile, cleaned, ta, cleaned, ta, 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 ta. My siblings now sweating in sync. Eyes forward, facing the mirrors. The basement air thin with heat again, her voice cutting through percussion, rattled with the mirror's return, her tongue metal in her mouth, the whole house buckling on beat, pulsing through copper pipes. So how could she really expect me to fall asleep? Me, eight and eager, up past midnight, all thud and twirl and overthinking, rancid with mismatched rhythm, an almost meter. My bedroom, a cluttered auditorium, I perform for no one. Barefoot, but promise my shoes next summer, then I can dance downstairs. Look and listen. I could make thunder too, I think, while pressing my ear to the floor. That's the poem. Thank you. Ooh, to be mothered by the music of hunger. I love that. Oh, so many good lines. I'm like, you can't keep up I'm trying to write down all the quotes from all these. Um, beautiful. We're gonna keep it moving. Our next reader is Fossil Mahudin, the author of The Displaced Children of Displaced Children with Eyewear Publishing 2018 and the chapbook The Riddle of Longing with Backbone Press 2017. He teaches English at Highland Park High School in suburban Chicago and, the creative, and creative writing at Northwestern University. And he serves as a master practitioner with the global not-for-profit Narrative 4. Go ahead, take it away, Fossil. Thank you so much, Marlon. Thank you, MPWW and, and, and Sue for inviting me here. I'm like beyond honored, I can't even say it, especially following uh, Kennedy and Sarah and Dante. And I know Glitter, Glitter Squirrel and Tracy are coming up next. So I just wanna thank everyone um, for having me here and everyone in the audience, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna read three poems and um, 
I will start with a piece called Guzzle for the Diaspora. We have always been the displaced children of displaced children, tethered by distant rivers to abandoned lands, our blood's history lost. To temper the grief, imagine your father's last breath as a mogul garden, marble pool at its center, the mirrored sky holding all his tribe had lost. Above the tussle of his wounded city, sad-eyed paper kites fight to stay aloft. One lucky child will be crowned the winner. Everyone else will have lost. Wish peace upon every stranger who arrives at your door, even the thief. For you never know when your last chance at redemption will be lost. In another version of the story, a steady loneliness mothers away the rust. Yet without windows in its hull, the time traveler's supplication gets lost. Against flame-lipped testimonies of exiles erasures, the swinging of an ax. Felled bunion trees populate your nightmares, new enlightenments lost. The rim of this porcelain cup is chipped, so sip with practiced caution. Even a trace of blood will copper the flavor, the respite of tea now lost. Tell me, Fassel, with what new surrender can you evade deeper damnation? Whatever it is, hack away before your children too become the lost. So a lot, of the, a lot of the poems I write are in response to silence and historical silence and about not knowing a lot about my family history. Uh, my family's from Pakistan and they you know, were refugees after the partition of 1947. And it was a history that never was talked about except in very sanitized, very like, it was great, we got our independence. And I feel like the, the, the topic that I'm most always thinking about is isolation, silence, and the, and the ways that silence kind of, you know, there's so many things we just don't talk about and, um, and they need to be talked about and written about. And so the next poem is actually a contemporary, it's my, probably my, uh, one of the newest poems I've written. And it, it brings up the silence that is associated with just the topic of Palestine, kind of what's going on there. And it says, uh, it's titled, When One of My Students Brings Up Palestine. And I know George Abraham wrote a lot, read a lot at last NPWWs you know, before time about Palestine. So I wanted to kind of on his um, heels read this. So when, a, when one of my students brings up Palestine, I do not smile at him, though I am happy to finally hear his voice in class discussion. I do not say his name or thank him for his comment, for how it is living proof that our study of literature, of fictional lives, of rhetorical moves really does matter, is a matter of life and death. I do not ask follow-up questions, do not inquire about what sources he consulted, if he evaluated their credibility, their bias, their audience and purpose, if there was evidence of the spin of some hidden agenda I do not ask others to respond before I do. Do not ask him to elaborate, to explain how and why any of this connects to those poems about spiders, to the ending of The Great Gatsby, to what prompted Chief Seattle to write his letter, to why it failed. I do not direct our conversation back to the dangers of silence. 
a topic every discussion this year, every year, my entire life seems to return to. I do not reach to scratch that sudden itch on my neck. I do not look out the window and wonder if it will still be raining on my drive home, if the traffic will be terrible, if I might again find myself dozing off at the wheel. I do not tell him that I haven't slept well for weeks, that I spend hours each night scrolling through social media feeds seeking out people's posts about Palestine, that I like every single one because they would have so few likes otherwise. I do not say a word about how I have been checking out all the recent posts by my closest friends, by people and organizations I have long admired, by individuals who always seem to be speaking up against injustice, just to see what they are and aren't posting about. I do not admit that the silences I find again and again make it harder to sleep, that enough small disappointments can break a person's heart, that this is a truth every teacher understands all too well. I do not get angry at him, call him out for deliberately trying to derail an otherwise meaningful conversation, do not accuse him of being difficult or unnecessarily political or some kind of punk ass who plays video games instead of doing his homework. I do not even look at him because I am afraid of seeing that familiar exhaustion in his eyes, a defeated spirit etched across his face too. I do not form a prayer in my mind, do not believe God will give even partial credit for work I mean to do but won't actually do. I do not look around the room to catch others' expressions to see which one of his classmates is already primed to report my response to their parents, to my department chair, my principal, whoever else might want to listen, ready to pounce on me for not saying the only thing I or anyone else is allowed to say on the topic. I do not open up one of those heavy red dictionaries on the wall, review the definitions of truth, hypocrisy, cowardice, brutality, occupation, self-defense, solidarity. I do not mention that there are many more allies out there than we might recognize, that I wish I could be brave enough to be one too. I do not tell my student in that moment or after class when no one is around to hear us talking that I admire his courage. I do not commend him for speaking up do not tell him I had been wrong about him all along, that he had good reason to be so quiet, to not care as much as I always had wanted him to care. I do not touch my quivering lips. I do not drop the pen in my hand and pretend it was an accident. I do not think about how days later I will be writing a poem about this and reading it right now. I do not tell the student that I'm losing faith in poetry and the power of words in myself as his teacher, in myself as a human being. When this student of mine brings up Palestine, I simply pretend not to hear him, knowing full well that everyone else will pretend with me, certain that this student will play along too. And then uh, my last poem is called Five Answers to the Same Question. One, I'll say thank you now for everyone. Um, five answers to the same question. One, I skip ahead to the end of the story and find God has taken refuge in the body of a bird. Two, outside my room, a steady rain is falling, its voice desolate, primitive, familiar. Three, when a dream 
returns him to me. My father hands me a nest filled with water. Four, the boy who planted the tree once swam in a lullaby, then climbed out estranged. And five, you catch your breath these days by seeking God, but forget sometimes to just listen. Thank you so much. Ooh. Oh, so many feelings. So, so many. Thank you. Thank you for that, Faso. Um, yeah. Oh, this my heart is like so with my students, especially. Summer break is a weird time to kind of reflect back over the year. Um, and so now this poem in that space um, is really beautiful and I think well timed. Thank you. Um, Make sure you're not missing uh, Sue's links in the chat um, for all of our readers so far. And then also there was a link to last month's reading if you wanna go back and see George Abraham and the rest of the incredible readers uh, from that reading on the YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll jump into our next featured reader who is Glitter Squirrel. Glitter Squirrel is an actor, gardener, playwright, poet, and prisoner in Minnesota. She has received three National Prison Writing Awards and one Fielding A. Dawson Award from Penn America. She enjoys taking college classes and watching other people cook. Let's now have our video from Glitter Squirrel. I need to know what is behind the red swastika on the back of her neck on permanent display that hates the Catholic, Jew, atheist, political dissident, gay, mentally ill, physically challenged in me. I shut my door, but unable to shun. Compassion tested, we make conversation because I need to know who is behind the swastika and I see her brown eyes. Will we speak of youth and poor company chemically induced decisions and weaknesses, or straight up fascism. She usually walks alone in the courtyard. I don't wanna love her and I don't, but I learned that I don't hate her like I do her tattoo of the red swastika on the back of her neck that hates me. Ooh, damn. Somebody said in the chat earlier that all of these opening lines are incredible and that continues to be true and then carries right on through, oof, right on through the poems. Uh, we've got some love in the chat. We have uh, an all caps glitter squirrel with lots of hearts. We have a damn glitter squirrel. We have that voice. We have powerful. Um, yeah, I feel like all of these poems today like also just take a lot of processing and they'll like continue to hit us as we move forward as well. Um, we also have a, we miss your voice, Glitter Squirrel. Um, whew, thank you. Um, this brings us, I believe, to our last reader. Last but not least, Tracy K. Smith. Um, super quick story. I met Tracy K. Smith about 10 years ago. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but I was in Saginaw when I was in college. Um, we were at the Theodore Retke house. It was an old historic house that um, Retke lived in at one point and it got turned kind of into a small museum. We were having lunch and I spilled some soup onto the table and tried uh, to get it out and, and it was not coming out of the table and I was very embarrassed by it and tried to hide it. Um, not long afterward, um, one of the very kind women who um, who runs the runs you know this house this little museum um, talks about how excited she is to have poets here and she's like you know we're really not supposed to use this table because it's a historic table that Retke used but we figured that when poets are here 
um, it's good for us to bring it out. I'm pretty sure I didn't have a tablecloth. Um, and so that was the time uh, that Tracy K. Smith was implicated in me defacing a historical uh, literary table. Uh, fun fact. Um, okay, here's the bio and we'll jump into Tracy's reading and then have our closing from there. Tracy K. Smith is the author of four books of poetry, including Life on Mars, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and her memoir, Ordinary Light, was named a finalist for the National Book Award. Her next collection, Such Color, New and Selected Poems, is forthcoming with Grey Wolf Press in October of 2021, this year. Most recently, she co-edited the anthology, There's a Revolution Outside My Love, with John Freeman. From 2017 to 2019, Smith served two terms as the 22nd Poet Laureate of the United States. She's currently a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and will begin teaching at Harvard University this fall. Take it away, Tracy. Okay, thank you so much, Marlon. Um, that really lovely afternoon flashed in my head when you first said Saginaw earlier. And I'm glad to know that I'm implicated in perhaps a <laughs> character building experience for a historic table. Um, this is the most moving reading I think I've been to ever. I'm so grateful for what feels like, you know, we're leaning into our cameras and I get to see your eyes as you're, I feel like you're reading to each of us individually, everyone. Um, I just feel very healed and enlarged by, um, by the poems that you've all read. So I'm, I'm grateful to add my voice to this evening. Um, I think I'll read three poems um, all from this current year. Um, and this first one is called Mothership. And um, I started writing it thinking about a dear friend who lost her mother um, toward the, just before the pandemic. And I am someone who's also kind of endured the loss of a mother. And I started thinking that our mothers knew each other finally somehow out there. But then the thought kind of continued and I started to realize that if that's true, then maybe all of our mothers, no matter who we are, know each other in a, in a different and fuller way than we let, let ourselves in, in life with all the difference and distance between us. And this is the poem that came out of that. It's called Mothership. You cannot see the mothership in space, it and she being made of the same thing. All our mothers hover there in the ceaseless blue-black, watching it ripple and dim to the prized pale blue in which we spin, we who are black and you too. Our mothers know each other there fully and finally. They see what some here see and call anomaly the way the sight of me might set off a shiver in another mother's son, a deadly silent digging in, a stolid refusal to budge, the viral urge to stake out what on solid ground is authority and sometimes also territory. Our mothers knowing better call it folly. And um, this is a poem called Rapture. Um, and it opens with a, a quote from filmmaker Arthur, Arthur Jaffa, who um, has made lots of films, among them um, Daughters of the Dust um, back in the 80s. But um, he also made a short film, I think it's about nine or 13 minutes long, called Love is the Message, the Message is Death, that's made up of cell camera footage, news footage, historical footage that is examining Black life, um, Black joy, Black praise, and um, death, and suffering, and loss in a way that um, is so moving and unforgettable. And of that film, he said, and on a simpler level, I want you to look up at these things that are happening to black people, not down, the way you would stare at the sun. 
rapture. It was a stirring and a rising like vapor, a gathering up and a lifting off. And then it was a swarm, all the many coalescing as a form unified in its going. Where, like I said, up and off, a rapture. Sometimes the light reversed course, reaching into me, a bright resonance, a flood spilling down. But soon it whirled, spun around, lifting over the trees, over the scraped stone tops of mountains to disappear through a ring of sky. I saw the shape of a woman in a wide cotton dress lying broken or sleeping or spent, lifted skyward into the distance and disappearing, dangling a foot in the black wake of history. And um, I'll close with a sequence um, called Riot that um, I guess each of these poems comes out of a different feeling process to what I'm used to as a writer. Um, this past year, as we all have lived it, um, has been so heavy and um, I've had to really find new ways of, of persisting through it, despite the fact that, you know, I, I feel myself to be fortunate. I'm well, my family has been safe this whole time. Um, and so one of the practices that's become really indispensable to me is meditation, which I've always thought my poetry was something like that, but I feel like this has been different. This year has um, been about, you know, visions and dialogues with you know, things that are not me, which has been um, so surprising and such a, a, a gift. Um, and so this is a poem that like the others I just read is built of images and phrases that really do feel like they're um, kind of a part of a two-way exchange with something that maybe is my unconscious mind, but I also tend to think maybe it's maybe it's ancestry or um, maybe it's it's something uh, unearthly. Um, and this poem opens with uh, an epigraph from Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, The Second Sermon on the Warped Land, which is um, this, these lines. This is the urgency, live, and have your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind. Riot. Sometimes I feel the black in my heart like a map made of tar. You need only part your lips to mar what isn't yours. Think better. Don't bother. Your druthers clog my sieve is the matter. We pay to live. Our nerves carry a charge. We grieve each day. We pray for you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. How thick is memory? How deep the grave? Thick is memory. Deep the grave. How many are we? Many are we? What have we been led here to learn, to teach? We have been led here to learn, to teach. Is life within our grasp? Life within is in our grasp. Have we ever felt death so near as we do this year? Have we ever? Near, dear, year upon year. The ancestors live upstairs in a room without chairs. When I visit 
They welcome me without words. They crouch, encircling me. They are without edges. Wordless, they fill me. Warmth without weight. I ask for something. Without shame, I beg. They owe me nothing, but they give. They give. Can you hold my death in your mind? Can you leave it there, live and let grieve? I like you. And like you, I move through the days. A dark shape is what my body makes. Good is how I was taught to look, to be, despite what's done to me. Woe is me. To say is to do is also true. Woe is you. This is not the riot. This is reality. It rolls, roils, briefly recoils. It hammers down. We fall, rebound. You chase. We race. You hate. We wait. Thank you so much. I'm so mad that I have to talk after listening to that and not just like sit in it for like a good 10 minutes. Oof, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is the end of the poems, but we're not done yet. We have a quick, uh, super quick Q&A. We're gonna ask one question. Um, it's kind of a two part and or question. So you can choose to answer one or both, whatever is in your heart. Um, we'll go in reverse order. So we'll start um, with Tracy with the response. We'll go to Fossil, Dante, Sarah. Uh, here's the question. Um, so when you are writing about difficult or painful content, what do you do to take care of yourself? How do you know when it's useful to write through the pain or when to give yourself some space? And I'll read it one more time. When you're writing about difficult or painful content, what do you do to take care of yourself? How do you know when it's useful to write through the pain and when to give yourself some space? Uh, that, that is a relevant question. Um, I, as I was talking about the meditation process, which is a way I think of a form of self-care um, because I, I believe that it both allows me to sink into myself and acknowledge what I'm feeling and acknowledge my questions or my needs and also to believe that I'm leaning towards something else and that feels um, healing in a way. Um, but I also um, this year have just kind of said, sometimes you have to lie down. <laughs> sometimes you just have to say, I have to lie down um, and give myself time, space, silence um, to rebuild something that has been drained or, or battered. Um, and I find that um, laughter, maybe, you know, I feel like, like I, I descend from a, a family and probably a, a people that have found the use of humor as something that bolsters and heals. Um, and so I find that laughing with my children, laugh, finding or taking the opportunity to laugh at myself sometimes um, or to, to find something like for me this year, it was just watching all seven seasons of Blackish over and over again um, to feel seen somehow by others in the world. Um, and so those are some of the things that, that have helped me get through the difficulty of this year and, and the desire to write about that difficulty as well. I think for so often like just writing is like what I need to do. And that's that's the way to like whatever I'm feeling sometimes there isn't a place or a, you know a group of people with whom I can like really explore it on, a, on like a deeper level. I think I mean like it, it's I know so many of our lives are so busy that sometimes 
everything that's happening is just kind of like skidding across my consciousness and then like going somewhere else. And then writing is where I'm like, okay, what am I feeling right now? Why am I feeling that way? And I need that kind of space. Um, and then and the other time, I think Tracy, you said it like just lying down like, has been like, I, I need to lie down like several times a day. Like, I, you know, teaching from home or being on Zoom. I think there, there's something about closing my eyes, being horizontal and just like the pressure takes off my back just from sitting down all day. Like that's been really important. And then the other thing, I mean, I'm, I'm a very religious person. So prayer has been really important to me and just having uh, solitude. Like there's people, you know, I have one son, you know, my wife and I are at home. Like there's not a lot of people around, but there's very few moments of silence. Um, and so like sometimes like, I, I just need to be alone as well. And, and the writing or prayer gives me that solitude and that quiet and that space. Absolutely, same, yes to prayer, yes to lying down. I, I definitely believe in prioritizing the body. Um, I am a very kinesthetic learner. And so when I can't um, process something through writing, I definitely, I dance and sometimes Sometimes language comes to me that way. Um, and then it becomes about dancing and chanting along with movement. Um, yeah, I, I know I need space from writing when um, I have that like, that rock in my throat, <laughs> you know, or when you sort of feel um, static build up in your body. And I just don't think it's worth it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm gonna move and I'm gonna come back to this poem or this thought later. and. Um, yeah, so that's it for me. I bought a bike at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, that helped a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, good. I'm like memorizing everybody's answers. And <laughs> also like, uh, I feel like not even like, you know, when I'm just writing intensely and also when I'm like writing under mad stress, sometimes I feel like, um, not sometimes, now I feel like just really disoriented. I don't really know how to say it. Like just know nothing, like don't know what to do. And then I don't know what to do and I feel guilty about it. And then I feel ashamed, like all oh, my writers to be here writing, but I'm just like, <laughs> you know, I'm just a person. So. I feel like, what do I do to decide or do, I just, I just don't, you know, I just, that's like, honestly, the best gift I've given myself is like, it's okay to not know what to do. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be lost. And it's okay to just do nothing. And I just think like, a lot of us have a problem with not doing nothing. You know, I think I have feel like shame and guilt because I feel like I have this privilege, right? Like a little bit of, at least like as a poet, say some shit, what do I do with it? And I'm like, I don't know. And I don't wanna do anything half-ass either. So I <laughs> just don't do it. And, and that feels good. And it feels good to like give myself time to figure it out. And I think sometimes like people will ask, well, what are you working on now? You know, you're like doing a reading and shit. And I'm like, I'm working on myself. <laughs> I'm working on myself cause like, shit's crazy and you know shout out to poetry but also like I'm busy like combating the institution and like my family and a lot of other things and so you know I'm not doing it in a poem I'm doing it in real life right now and it's okay to just be overwhelmed and not do it for a minute and um I mean it's been pretty 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 liberating and so, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm doing, I'm chilling <laughs> when I have to chill. Oh, thank you for those thoughtful, beautiful responses. I love that. Um, I'm gonna have to go back to the recording and re-listen to all of them again later. Um, we're gonna have some special messages. First, we're gonna hear from Aaron Sharkey, then Deborah Appleman, Deborah Appleman, and then uh, Jennifer Bowen. So if y'all want to just go ahead and jump in uh, with these special messages, closing thoughts, um, and then we'll wrap after that. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And so much to all the readers. What a really, this reading's always good, but it was really good. Um, so yeah, greetings to all our students. We miss you so much. Uh, we're thinking about you all the time and really excited to get back inside with classes and collectives. Um, so I wasn't sure what to share today, but this is what I'm doing. So here we go. Um, my friend Alexis uh, taught me about oracles and um, I knew what they were before, I think, but um, I've been really excited about a new way to think about what an oracle is. Um, I hadn't really found them useful before um, until she invited me to do a practice with my books. Um, an oracle, in case you don't know, is a person or an agency, a, ca a, cap um, a capacity, a state, a condition, an action, activity, an operation that invites wisdom in, that um, invites uh, insightful counsel, that allows you to make predictions. Um, and Alexis invites me to write, to ask books those questions. Um, and, uh, you know, as I'm at crossroads to ask, what should I do? What maybe should I write about? What am I thinking about these things? Um, and to use the thing that I find in the book as a foil for that. Um, and it also engages chance, which I think is such a cool thing to think about as a writer and um, also invites you to remember your own wisdom and to see the truth in what you're looking at. So I'm gonna read um, something from Alexis Pauline Gum's book, Spill, um, Scenes of Black Feminist uh, Fugitivity. And it's organized around the definitions of the word spill. Um, and she made a rule, um, many rules actually, and followed them. So we'll talk about that as, at the end, I'll give you a prompt that gives you a rule. So spill, noun, a fall from a horse or bicycle, Granddad took a spill while riding the, the bay mare. Synonyms fall or tumble. Verb cause someone to fall off a horse or bicycle. The horse was wretched off course, spilling his rider. Synonyms unseat, throw, dislodge, unhorse. The horse spilled its rider. Hear the chainsaw laughter. Hear the tree killing parking lot laughter. Hear the smoked away resistance. Hear the tar stuck, the choking laughter. Hear the dominoes razor, hear the domino razor's edge laughter. Hear the scratch ma's good table and destroy food forever laughter, laughter. Hear the sound that made her stop caring. Hear the overworked husband ridicule his wife with all the homeboy staring. Hear the cut through the rings and snap and everything laughter. Laughter, laughter, hear the dreams of our mother fall to the floor and never get raised up after. Again, spill Alexis Pauline Gums. Um, when I'm not sure what to write, sometimes it helps me to give myself rules um, to find inspiration from constraints like what is my word limit or um, what, how many words am I trying to add to something or what's one thing I wanna include or one thing that I want to exclude. Um, this year has been really hard for many of us. It's a year full of losses. Um, many of us have lost, lost time with loved ones, lost connections with people. My father died of COVID this November. Um, lots of losses. One of my other losses is that I've lost time with y'all. And um, I really am missing the Lino Lakes uh, Writing Collective and um, especially uh, David's uh, prompts for us in the collective. I think it's my favorite place to write. I've written some of my favorite things in the last couple of years at that collective. So um, he would write three elements on the board and invite us to include those three elements as rules in our writing. So you can write anything you want. That can be a story um, based on a memory or something that happened in your life, or it can be um, a poem. But here are your rules, the three elements um, to use in whatever writing you'd like. Um, include a body of water, include an unexpected smell, and include a t-shirt that has numbers or words on it. Um, I'm excited to read what you write uh, and excited to get back in there with y'all. Thanks so much. Um. Thanks everyone for this opportunity. Um, students, I wanted to echo what Erin said about how much we miss you. 
And um, I always remind myself of this um, quote by the Aboriginal scholar, Lilla Watson. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think I feel, and I know so many of us who have had the privilege of work, working with you feel that our liberation is bound up with yours um, and that we are better for having been with you and we miss you desperately. What I wanted to share with you is um, a poem by Pablo Neruda. And I feel that the poets that we heard tonight um, fulfill um, what he says, the title of this poem is Poet's Obligation. Poet's Obligation. To whoever is not listening to the sea this morning, to whoever is cooped up in house or office, factory or street or mine or harsh prison cell. To him I come and without speaking or looking I arrive and open the door of his prison and a vibration starts up, vague and insistent. A great fragment of thunder sets in motion, the rumble of the planet and the foam the raucous rivers of the ocean flood, the star vibrates swiftly in its corona and the sea is beating, dying and continuing. So drawn on by my destiny, I ceaselessly must listen to and keep the seas lamenting in my awareness. I must feel the crash of the hard water and gather it up in a perpetual cup so that Wherever those in prison may be, wherever they suffer in the autumn's castigation, I may be there with an errant wave. I may move, passing through windows, and hearing me, eyes will glance upward, saying, how can I reach the sea? And I shall broadcast, saying nothing, the starry echoes of the wave, a breaking up of foam and quicksand, a rustling of salt withdrawing, the gray cry of seabirds on the coast. So through me, freedom and the sea will make their answer to the shuttered heart. And I'm sure many hearts were opened tonight by hearing these amazing poems. We miss you and we can't wait to see you again. I'll just jump in really quickly here at the end um, of this series, which has been um, not what we all envisioned, but what we've all um, accepted as the pandemic reality. Um, first of all, this this night, every time I uh, visit one of these readings, I think it can't get any better that I won't be more emotional, but I do. They're just so much, um, so grave and so beautiful and so real. And I'm really, really honored to get to be a part of this series. Um, thank you for everyone who read tonight. Marlon, you're a really elegant host, which sucks for you because we're going to call you in now all the time now that I know what you're capable of. Um, and then before we say a final goodbye for the season, um, thank you so, so much to all of the readers, hosts, instructors, and audience members have, who have shown up for this series. Y'all, they're getting broadcast in the facilities, in the prisons. They're getting shown in, in individual cells. They're getting shown in living units, and they're getting um, saved onto DVDs that folks can check out in the library. And it's really, really meaningful. So thank you so much for taking the time to stop in and um, show the folks that we really miss that they are separate from us, but not alone. It's been a, it's been really wonderful to have so many of you here. Um, we are also really grateful for the DOC education staff at each and every facility, their patience and resiliency in broadcasting all of these readings, plus making programming happening during a pandemic has been 
um, kind of Herculean and, and really miraculous. And we're very grateful that we have been able to continue to stay in contact in, in these small ways. And um, I know that their life has been really complicated this year. So we're grateful to them. Um, Mike Alberti has done the tech work for us. We're grateful to him. Had, had you all left it up to me, there would be no readings. We would all just be watching Fuzz. He's amazing. Um, Sue Wong is the magical, beautiful, bright-hearted genius behind the Before Time Reading series, and she's made something super, super special. Um, something that transcends, I think, most readings and certainly the pandemic. Um, this has been a respite during a really long year, and I know that it's as special as, as it is because Sue has been the one behind the scenes. So thank you very, very much, Sue. And then most of all, I wanna say thanks to you, our students who are watching this sometime between now and four months from now, whenever it manages to happen in your facility. Um, thank you all for watching us and hanging in there. Um, we hope this reading has helped you see that we're still here, we're still thinking of you. And of course we miss you so, so much. Um, we're all ready to come back the second the gates open. And um, I, I've got my plastic bag, it's already packed. We're ready to go. Um, if you want a prompt from us in the facility, go ahead and write about what you will say when your mics are off, when all the mics are off, when you can speak to anyone who you've been hearing throughout the year on these reading series, or when you can hear, hear their words speaking back to you. Um, that's my prompt to you. And in the meantime, those of you that are in the audience tonight, I think there are about 40 of us left. Um, feel free to turn on your mics here and Marlon will take us out with a hello to the writers. Um, they hear these goodbyes and these hellos when we say goodnight at the end of the reading series. And this is this is the final series from the pandemic year. So please turn your mic on and share your love. Good thank night. you, readers. Thank you, audience. Thank you, students. Thank you, students. Thank you, everybody. Love you all. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, 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 thank you Aaron. Okay, thank you, Erin. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Jen. Woo! I love you, students. So incredible. It's a beautiful way for us to end season one. Well, no. Thank you all for being here. Good night. Um, Good night.